left off, okay, I promised you papers, right? I promised you um, all of the all of the list of the, all the mitzvahs and the times in which they were given uh, prior to Mount, uh, Mount, the, the, the uh, revelation at Mount Sinai. We also discussed some of the uh, some of the other um, mitzvahs that were given after and prior to. I will go through some of them uh, shortly. Um, we left off, just so that we know, we left off at the end of Leviticus. And the end of Leviticus, we have a lot of interesting information um, uh, that, we, that we, uh, we went through quickly. It was last week's par- Parsha as well, so we'll get into that in one minute. Let me quickly just pay up my debt. The first debt that I had, I told you I was gonna, we were going to clarify when the Torah was given, when some of the commandments were given. So let's start like this. I want to start with an apology. My first apology is that my printer broke this afternoon when I was trying to print it. This like late evening, like 25 minutes, a half hour ago. So, and I was going to print. It wouldn't have been enough copies because I, I only was preparing for 10. Thank God we have a lovely turnout, so it's great. But either way, um, I had everything printed out, re- everything prepared, ready to go. And I also included a couple of other things that I did not tell you I was going to add. But that was also the vestments of the Kohen Gadol. Which we, we listed quickly. Yeah, I also corrections. just I also added the list of what is and what isn't kosher, so you can know right away regarding animals, land animals, uh, uh, animals that are in the water, um, creature insects and and uh, water animals, fish. Uh, we also spoke. We also I also wrote over there um, things that grow from the ground. Uh, all of it, just very basic, very concise, very clear, so that there's no no questions um, on on the on, on the surface level. Okay, what was given to the Jewish people and when? So the first thing is that on Rosh Chodesh Elul, which is 15 days prior to the Jews leaving Egypt, 15 days before uh, Passover, the Jewish people received. Not sorry, not Elul. Sorry, the beginning of the month of Nisan. I apologize. Thank you. Um, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of Nisan, which is 15 days prior to Pesach, the Jewish people received several mitzvahs. The first is the Jewish calendar. Ha-chodesh, hazel, lachem, Rosh Chodeshim. The first commandment where God tells the Jewish people, as a people, that Nisan is going to be the first month of the Jewish calendar. Now, even though our Rosh Hashanah is Tishrei, which is six months later, that's when we count the years. But the but the 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 the, um, the Mishnah tells us that there are four different Rosh Hashanahs. There's a Rosh Hashanah for man, which is what we call Rosh Hashanah. There's also a Rosh Hashanah for the year, and that Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the month of Nisan. So that's the first commandment given to the Jewish people: is a Chodesh Hazelachem Rosh Chodeshim. Then God gives us the commandment of uh, Pesach for that year, and Pesach for generations, that we should teach it to our children, and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And when we celebrate Pesach with our children this year, and next year, and the year after, what we're doing is we're fulfilling a biblical commandment. I will tell you, a friend of mine told me um, that in order to get his children and grandchildren to participate, he did an early Pesach. He did, like, instead of doing it in the evening, they did it during the day. Unfortunately, he did not fulfill the biblical commandment. It has to be evening of Pesach, not a day earlier, not a week earlier. Right? It's, it's got to be specifically on that day. Next, another mitzvah of, of holidays. All the mitzvahs of holidays were given also on the, on the beginning of the month of Nisan, and then the last mitzvah, and then also the mitzvah of um, Kadesh Likol Bechor, which is sanctifying the firstborn. And then we have another mitzvah of just general rules, mishpatim. There's a, this, there's a discussion as to whether or not the mishpatim means, um, means specifically the ordinances that are given in the in the parsha of Mishpatim, or it's general rules, general laws that are given. Okay, 
That was given 15 days prior to Matan Torah, prior to the Jew, to the Exodus. Now, we know that the Exodus began, but only a few days later did the sea split. The Jewish people had to travel to get to the sea. When did they actually get to the sea? Shvi Shal Pesach, the seventh day of Pesach. It took seven days till they got there. Three days after that, they were in a place called Mara. In Mara, they received other mitzvahs, like we mentioned last week. Okay, then the Jewish people. Um, do you have the list of what, what, what mitzvahs were given in Mara? No. So you said seven took seven days to get there, three days before that. So five three days, days after that. After that. After so it's a total of ten days after the Exodus from Egypt. Sorry, fifteen days. What makes sense? Confused here. Ten days. Let me pull this up. Apologize. Um, what was the city? The town? Mira. Mara. Not of that. Oh, we're from the attendance? Please? Okay, so uh, sorry. Ten days after leaving Can Egypt. You have one hand down? No, I don't. Let's find out. Okay, so sorry. Ten days after leaving Egypt, which is three days. Three days after the splitting of the sea, I was correct. The Jews were in Mara, and they received. Are we good? <laughs> yeah. No problem. Okay, so the Jewish people received several different mitzvahs. They received Shabbos, the mitzvah of Shabbos, the mitzvah of Parah Aduma, which is the red heifer, honoring your parents, and over here, sorry, there were the general laws. Not, not, uh, not on the beginning of Nisan, okay? 40 days after that, which is now 50 days after the beginning of the Exodus, the Jewish people are at Mount Sinai, and we receive on the Shavuot the Ten Commandments. There's a public revelation. 40 days after that, Moses descends with the first set of tablets, which are then broken on that day, the 17th of Tammuz, because of the sin of the golden calf. Forty days after that is the beginning of Elul, and that's when Moses ascends up the mountain to plead for mercy for the Jewish people. That God should accept our, it should, should, we should, we should receive complete atonement for our sins. And then forty days after that was Yom Kippur, which is the tenth of Tishrei. And the Jewish people receive the second set of tablets from Moses, and they're forgiven. Now, the first set and second set of tablets were both placed into the Ark, into the, into the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which is known as the Aron. And there was something else that was placed in there. Anybody knows what was placed in there as well? No. Staff. Aaron's the staff. Well, also, no, 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 no. The, the 13th copy of the Torah, right? Because one went to each tribe, and one went into the ark. So three things went into the ark. But you said that the first two tablets went into the ark? Mm -hmm. I thought he broke it, so he, he took the brush of the He the took the broken pieces. He put the broken pieces Yeah. Yeah, and then Because you have to also remember that the first set of, 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 uh, of tablets were unbelievably miraculous tablets. We mentioned earlier when we discussed that is you can see them from all directions. You can see right through them. It was it was just uh, right. That was also placed into the, into the uh, okay. Then we have a hundred. Uh, okay, so it's a total of hundred and twenty days after after Shavuot and hundred and seventy days after. Exodus, that the Jewish people received the atonement, and we're now getting the second set of tablets. Over the next following six months, the Jewish people received the rest of the commandments. You're going to give all this to us next 
Well, <laughs> next time we meet, I can email it to whoever wants. I'm sorry, I, a technical difficulty. I was not, not able to print that. There is no next week. Yeah. There is next week. There's next, next week. Uh, it's just going to be Shavuot. Motesha <laughs> right. uh, Shavuot. Okay. Either way, the, fa- the, the next 180 days, the majority of the mitzvot were taught orally by Moses. And uh, the following years, up to halfway through Exodus, was written by Moses. Forty years later, they're now not at Mount Sinai anymore. Now they're at Arvos Moab. And on, 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 the, on the, my sheet, I, I outlined exactly the time period, the actual date and year, and what was given them. So it's, it's very organized. You know exactly, you know, in chronological order, exactly when, when, when. Okay, so in Arvos Moab, which is the end of 40 days, right before Moses is passing away, is when the Torah was completed in its full writing. Thirteen copies were given, one to each tribe and one into the Ark. And um, I was talking this over with my rabbi last week, and he, he, he said that the, the Talmud in Yerushalmi uh, goes through the exact um, way that they were able to fit the, the, um, the two sets of tablets and the Torah into the Ark. The Ark was not that big. And here you're putting these stones and you're putting everything in. It goes through the exact measurements and everything, how they fit perfectly into the Ark. <laughs> oh, well, so it says, Luchot, a Luchot Ha'even, right? It says that there were, there were stones. So we have to understand what that means. It, Moses wrote it on a stone. He wrote the entire Torah. Today it's written on a, on a parchment. Do you have any idea how big the uh, I don't. I'm not off the top of my head. No. Yes. Yeah. They're, 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 they're right. Right. Yeah. Also, I added on that sheet what were the twelve uh, stones that were in the breastplate of the Kohen, the, the color, the name of each stone, and for each tribe. Uh, the, the so that's that we'll, that we see as we'll see as well. Okay. So let's talk. That's correct. Whoever will email me, I'll happily send it to them, so that way I'll, I won't forget anybody's. So, so if you just email me, you can even email now. But I'm in no class. I start ringing here. Um, either way, let's resume. Let's continue. Okay, so we're up to page number five, which is Famidbar um, numbers. Now it's very interesting. Bamidbar is always the portion that precedes Shavuot. This Shabbos is going to be Bamidbar. And uh, it's always the Shab, the Parsha, that precedes Shavuot. And the reason is because what is a Midbar? A Midbar, our sages tell us, is a desert. And our sages tell us that in order to uh, benefit from the Torah, we need to be humble like a desert. A desert, people step on the desert. People will trample on the desert. You have to know that if you're going to receive the Torah, if you're going to be a receptacle that's able to receive the Torah, you have to be humble. Humility is the number one quality to accepting Torah. Without humility, it is impossible for someone to really internalize the message of the Torah. We see the following. The first book of the Torah we said was what? Dealing with the family of Israel. Right? The fundamentals of Judaism. The second book of the Torah was about the nation of Israel. The revelation. It's all about the relationship with the Jewish people. The third is the relationship with God. Keeping God in our midst and living holy. What is the third? The third is living as Jews and feeling the divine providence. Now they're going to have to live through the miracles. Now they're in the desert and they're not going to have water uh, you know, coming from a natural resource, it's going to be coming from a rock. 
They're not going to have food coming from the fields or from. It's a desert. So where are they going to get all that food? Where are they going to get all those resources? You mean the fourth book? Fourth book. Yeah, fourth book. Sorry, sorry. Bamidbar. Right. I got my numbers mixed up. It's only five numbers. <laughs> but the fourth book is numbers. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay, so we have. Uh, the Jews travel and they live as Jews. It's a very important to understand that in a cocoon, right, or the Jewish cocoon, it's easier to live as a Jew. But when we go out and we, we're in, in, in the offices of Halliburton or we're in the offices of Cameron or we're in the offices of Exxon, we, we li- we know we're living not in our own comfortable environment. It's much more difficult to live as a Jew. And this is part of the experience that the Jewish people were going to see as a theme throughout this book that when the Jewish people left their comfort zone, they had challenges. When the tribes went to, when, when, the, when the spies went to Israel, they had some difficulty keeping their, you know, keeping their, their, their balance. When, uh, when Korach, right, was when, had difficulties. Again, he was, when we're not in our steady place, we have difficulty. We saw this when we talked about Vayetze Yaakov. When Yaakov left, when he went out, it says that Yitziat Tzadik min HaMakom Osar Roshem. Rashi says that when a Tzadik, when a person leaves a city, it has an impact. Not only when he leaves a city. When he leaves, uh, when he leaves his home, it has an impact not only on himself, but it has an impact on the whole city. Okay, because again, the balance is thrown out of, out of, out of whack. But... The understanding that we, we get into a danger zone when we're, when we're not in our comfort zone. When we're not in our, we, we have a regular routine, we know when we, when we live, when we're home in our own city, we have our own schedule, every day the same routine, we go to our synagogue, we know where we sit in that synagogue, you know, we have our, our set things. When we're not in our place, things can get, get, get you know, out of, out of hand. Our grandfather would always say that if you wanted to see how organized you are in life, and how you have things in order, you have to see how you react to abnormal situations. A person who has his life in order, even in abnormal situations, recalibrates. God is always sending us curveballs, right? Someone has to leave their home, someone is moving, someone has a flood, someone has a fire, someone has a baby, someone has an illness, All of these different things throw us curveballs. And the question is, how do we rebound and how do we continue our routine relationship with God even when things are not the normal uh, normal flow? And that's that's part of what we see, the challenge that the Jewish people have here in the desert. They're in a new place. They're constantly traveling. If we count every time the Jewish people travel, they're traveling and they camp, and they're traveling and they camp, they're packing up again, going to the next place. Every place comes with its challenges. Every change comes with its challenges. And that's what we need to take as a lesson for ourselves, is to, even though we may have these challenges, keep in mind and always stay focused to, um, to uh, uh, being grounded and staying true to our, 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 principle, our principles, to our relationship with the Almighty. Okay, so let's begin here. We start off by Midbar is the census. Okay, so the first three, uh, first three portions are dealing with the encampment around the tabernacle. Uh, we start off with the census. It's important to know uh, how many Jews we have as, 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 a, as a, yes? Now, why do they separate the Levites from the other tribes? Okay, because... because Okay, we'll see that in a minute, because the, the Levites were unique in that they never, uh, they never uh, assimilated, they, never beca- they, never were, they were never enslaved either. Uh, they were always like sort of the, 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 the ministers, or the, you know, the, 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 you know that's what they're, they're called, the, the, um, the, uh, the Levites were the, 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 the Kohanim, the priests, were also from the Levite tribe. Right, so they were they were separate. They were separated. They were not. Okay. They were separated. In that way. They always stayed separate. In Egypt, they didn't. They were never were. They were never part of the slavery. 
How did they not go there? How were they not there? Oh, so, so that was part of the agreement that they were able to negotiate. Joseph did this. As he said, just like the Egyptians have spiritual leaders to keep them inspired that lived in a certain city, the Jewish people should also have uh, a spiritual people who keep them inspired. And Pharaoh agreed to it. And those were the those were the Levites, and the Levites were never subject to the to the slave trade. I thought the Kohanim's was a separate tribe. They're part of the, yeah, they are. They're from the tribe of Levi. The well, Levites. So they didn't get a portion of the land either. They're, they're not one of the twelve tribes. They are. No. Oh, they're not counted as one of the twelve recipients of right because they got a portion of every tribe's land. They didn't get any land. Right. They were all over the place. They were. All right. So this is the census. We have the tribal leaders are are announced who they are. Um, different tribe camps, also in that fabulous document that I'll send you, hopefully. Um, it, has, it has exactly the encampment of who was on the north, the east, the, east, the, se the south, the west, and who was the, in the inner circle, Moses and Aaron, and uh, the, the, the three other um, families of Aaron and, and Moshe, Moshe that surrounded the tabernacle in the inner circle. The total count was 603,550 men between the age of 20 and 60. And it's interesting that they were almost the same number as the, as the, as the previous census, which is 13 portions ago. This is some time, right? Well, the first census was when? was back in, yeah, I think it was by Yakel. Yeah, but yeah, is it? What was the time period? Time. Um, were they on the Exodus? I, I don't know how much time we're dealing with from now to then. It's, I, I don't. I don't remember how much time it was, but it was. It was. It was some time. Look, under it, Moses, for us, for us, it's four months, five months of okay. repeating it. It's under Moses. The second? Yes, it's all under. Yeah. Okay. First thing and the second was done under Moses. Right. So it's some number. And we can have many more times. Some number of years. We can have right. We can have many more times right. that the and I saw it. This okay. I I endorsed numerous. Uh, books, right? So this is a fabulous copy of a fabulous Schottenstein edition. The, what makes this special is that it has an interlinear translation. So under each word is a translation. There's also the the, uh, the blue one, which is the stone edition Chumash. I think I put that in my in the study. There's also the stone edition Tanakh, highly recommended. And there's one other book that I want to recommend, which is the Living Torah by Rabbi Ari Kaplan. Right, this is amazing. This is amazing. Right. So if you want to, if you want, I'll tell you. I'll be honest with you. The Torah that I that I and, and a lot of what I prepared here is taken from here and from here. It's our Torah, right? So you take it from, right? Uh, but it's amazing how clearly he translates. And on the bottom, he has many many of his own commentaries that he puts in, and commentaries from other uh, other uh, great sages um, to help us. Clearly and sim 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 uh, simply uh, understand each of the um, the different opinions. C R E Kaplan. Yeah. C A C A N. Okay. It's interesting that you ask that because I have two brother-in-laws. Two sisters are both married to Kaplan's. One is with a C and one is with a K. You see That's right. <laughs> So, at least we're consistent. We stay with the same last name, different spelling is fine. Okay. So, the total count is 603,550. Excluding. Between 20 and 60. Between 20 and 60. Men between 20 and 60. So, if you want to calculate the total amount of people, you duplicate that into women, right? So, it's, it's 1.2 million. And then you have children under the age of 20 and adults over the age of 60. Right, so children under the age of 20 is another third of that, so that's another 600,000, right? Uh, sorry, another 300. Well, you have to double because it's male and female. Under the age of 20, and it's a third, right? It's a half, sorry. So it's, it's another, another 600,000, so it's 1.8. Then another, how old were people living? They were living more than they live today. Most live to 120, so let's assume they live 100 years, right? So you have another... It's another 1.2 million, so 3 million people. Plus, you have all the Egyptians that join. In addition, to In addition to that, there's a whole lot of people there. I'm talking about. So, what's the reason for defining it of men only? Why not 13? Why 13 years of age? Why 20? 
um, because 20 is the time that, um, that we're responsible for our actions in the heavenly courts. That's when you're a real man, when you take responsibility for your actions on a whole new level. When we're bar mitzvah, that's when we start to take responsibility, but our punishments for our, uh, you know, indiscretions are here, right? At the age of 20, those indiscretions have punishment in the world to come. Uh, the truth is, just as a side note, um, our sages many, many times had tremendous uh, desire for those punishments, those afflictions to take upon them, to come upon them here in this world. Because it's a tremendous blessing. Okay, we have to see this like this. Okay, I'll just mention very quickly. A rabbi once came to my grandfather and asked him, how do I explain to my students that sometimes people die young? So my grandfather answered that the premise of the question is flawed. Because the premise of the question uh, undertakes a, 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 a perspective that we're supposed to live forever. And if we don't live till we're 120, then something's wrong. But that's not true. The real premise should be, and the correct premise is, we're here for a purpose. And as soon as we complete that purpose, we go on to the next, to the next level. And that's the, that's the world to come. So you're talking about punishment. So anybody under the age of 20 yeah. is, not is not punished in the world to come. How about people that are under 60? They're good. They're good. Yeah, you know, this class only has three people. This is a tough class. Everyone's under 20, so yeah. There you go. All right, so the camping formation, which I shared in that document, exactly who was who was placed where. If you give me a quick second, I'll pull it up right here. The document you do not have, correct. Just remind me. Just remind me. <laughs> okay, so we have in the north, we had Dan, Asher, and Naftali. On the east, we had Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. In the south, we had Gad, Shimon, and Reuven. And on the west, we had Benjamin, Menashe, and Ephraim. And the inner circle with the tabernacle, surrounding the tabernacle, on the north, we had Merari. On the east, we had Moses and Aaron. On the south, we had Kahat. And on the west, we had Gershon. And the tabernacle was in the middle. So the God the Yes. God yes, very clearly. Right? Exactly where, who went where. Where is the center? Center where, was the tabernacle. Where is the center? Not, not the... Wherever they could. It was the center, and everyone camped around it. But there's no region. That's the center of that, that area. Of that area, exactly. But it's not described. Where From it, so it says in the corner, there was an open area of four thousand cubits, in each of the four corners. We want to know where it was in the land. relationship to where it's present day. Where is it? Oh, oh, it's all through the Sinai Desert, all, all the through the desert. desert, all the way till Jordan. Okay. So when they when they when they, when they moved, did they have to move? Everything, everything moved. It was a big, it was a big hassle. Yeah. Yeah, and they, and they had to get in that formation every time. That's right. And each one had a flag, an identity. Um, it's very, which is also an interesting thing that you had twelve different tribes, twelve different flags. And why? Because everyone, uh, I, I said this rule in one of the classes here recently. Everybody wants to feel unique. Everybody wants to feel special. And it's like it's. Lahavdil Elif Alfi Abdullah is never to compare between holy and unholy. But think of it as like sports teams. Every sports team has their own flag and their own logo, and they run up and down the fields and the courts with their flag, and it gives them pride, right? Look at us, we're the Texans, right? Not to be compared between holy and unholy. The tribes had, had their own their own identity. And the tribe of Dan had their flag that stood at the front of them, and they felt proud of it, and they had a certain uniqueness to their own to their own character. It's the symbol. Yes, the symbols of the, that was okay. Did they compete? What? Did they compete? Yeah, they had like, uh, they had Olympics. No Olympics. No, Olympics. no, Olympics. no, no tribal Olympics. 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 Yes, they had a formation of how they traveled. What did you I know exactly. They traveled. All right, all right. 
Did so we had the we had challenge each other though. I mean, for oh, were, spiritually, yes. But not that's the strength. It, that's not no. It wasn't traditionally sports is not exactly a Jewish. Uh, it was more a Greek thing, correct? Yeah, it was more of a Greek thing. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really intermarriage between the tribes. It's really no, it's not, it was not really. It wasn't common. Talking about uh, wars, there weren't conflicts. You know, one person, two shuls. You know. <laughs> you know, you know this joke about that, right? This guy comes to visit his friend on an island. <laughs> And he shows him around. He says, "This is my island." And he shows him here. This is one synagogue. He goes, so you know, you know, over here, this is the other synagogue. He says, "It's only you. Why do you need two synagogues?" He says, "This synagogue. Go to this synagogue. I won't step foot in." Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was last week. Yeah, last week or two weeks ago. Either way, so apologize if you're if you're seeing this online and you hear it again. I apologize. All right. So the camping formation is, is, is made clear, the appointment of the Levites and all of their tasks. Um, we redeem all firsts, redeeming of the first of our crops, we redeem the first of our sons, and we redeem the first of our, uh, of our animals, right? There's a specific <coughs> mitzvah to redeem the first of the donkeys, right? Petar Hamor, which has a special, special uh, commandment. All right, the total count of the Levites was 22,000. The firstborn are redeemed, the Kohanites are organized, and the special precautions for the Kohanites to maintain their, uh, their sanctity and their holiness. Yeah, we'll get to it another time. Just like you come and we get to the red herring. We will. We will. <laughs> it's not the herring. It's, it's the heifer. heifer. It's the heifer, yeah. That's the red herring. You can tell me. That's the fill of the fish now. Yeah. All right, so the, so the next. The next portion. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the next portion is Parshas Nasso, and it's the distribution of responsibilities, the recounting of the, of the people, purification of the camp, repenting for theft. There is an offering which was brought for people who, who weren't uh, scrupulous in their business dealings. Then we talk about the Sota, which is the wayward, uh, ad adulterous woman. And, uh, and then there's the Nazarite. So just a very quick important Tvar Torah that it's, it's, we need to remember this our entire lives. The question, we know this, that, uh, and I think we may have mentioned it in the beginning of this, of this course, that the Torah places every single portion in the exact perfect place that it needs to be. And the question is why one portion is next to the other portion, and there are many, many commentaries uh, that deal with this. Why this portion next to that portion? Why that portion next to this portion? And, that, and, and so on and so forth. But the uh, glaring question is why you would have the adulterous, a suspicious, suspected adulterous woman next to the portion of the Nazarite. So our sages say an incredible thing. The Nazarite, okay, let's step back a second. Our sages tell us that there's nothing that your eyes see that you're not supposed to see. Meaning, it's a message for you to see. If someone, if you're ever standing someplace with a friend of yours or with your, your significant other, and you're looking at something and you, you see something, you say, hey, did you see that? Or if you're ever standing and you see an accident, but you don't see it, the person's next to you saw it, but you were right there, but you didn't see that second. They saw this, that, that second of the collision, you didn't see it. You wonder, why did they see it, not you? You're both standing right there. You're in, in Walmart, and you see, or in Target, um, uh, and you see a, a parent yelling at their child. You ever wonder why did you need to see that? You could have been two aisles over, and not have to see it, and not have to hear it. Why did you have to see that? So the Baal Shem Tov tells us an incredible lesson. He says, everything that you see is a mirror of yourself. It's a message. It's telling you something. Wake up, because this is you. Maybe not now, but maybe soon it's you. 
And if you don't wake up, right, that's what you're going to look like. You ever wonder um, if, if, God forbid, we were to ever see someone uh, in a car accident and we find out that they were on their cell phone? Right? Shouldn't that be a message? Shouldn't that be a message for us? Right? It's, it's a wake-up call. Why, why did I need to see that? Why, I could have gone on a different road. Why did I have to see that? It's a wake-up call. Baal Shem Tov says, there's nothing that you see that you weren't supposed to see. It's a wake-up call for you. Let's go to the Nazarite. A man is walking in the street, and he sees the, the, the procession of the, of the, of the, the Betin, uh, or the questioning of this this way this uh, adulterous uh, suspiciously or the alleged uh, adulterous woman. Why did he need to see that? You know why he needed to see it. God is telling him if you don't watch out and take a, a precautionary measure to ensure that it doesn't become you, that's you. That's why we have the Nazarite right after. Because how did this woman fall into this questionable situation? She probably got drunk. What does the Nazarite do? He abstains from wine. He keeps himself away from wine. That means when we see something, we have to do something. You see something. You see someone. Someone. Uh, um, someone. Think of any any situation. We see someone uh, is having uh, heart issues. Maybe we should change the way we eat. We see someone who's having a challenge with the, with the physical ailment. Maybe we need to do more exercise. We see someone talking on television who's ignorant. Maybe we need to learn more. That's your comment. <laughs> but you understand, there's whatever. Now, the question is um, why we have to see and hear so many awful things on the radio. You turn on the radio in the morning, you look at the newspaper, right? And you hear all these terrible stories. You read all these times, it's terrible. Why do we have to hear this? Perhaps it's because today we don't have a value for life. Perhaps today we don't understand the importance of a human life. There's no value for it anymore. Today it's just, uh, eh. It's to be like, like in, the, in, in other, in other uh, eras where human life was just a, uh, you know, it was a sport. Today we're killing so and so. Why? Because it's his turn. That's not the way we should. We should understand that treating people properly, with respect, with with dignity, is is human value, and we should make sure that every, all of our dealings are with proper, uh, with proper respect. So the Nazarite is placed right next to the sota, right next to the wayward woman, to tell us this important, important lesson. If you see something, it's not by mistake that you had to see it. Okay. The, the laws of sudden contamination, priestly blessings, um, that they have the power to put the name of God, right? It says, The Kohen can only place the name of Hashem on the Jewish people, but God is the one who blesses them. Meaning that it's not the Kohen, it's not the, the, the blessed earth that has the power, but rather they put in the goodwill, they send the email, the question is whether God's going to say, I accept. Right? We see uh, the priestly blessings, okay? The offering of tribal leaders, um, each one of the leaders of the tribe brought an offering, and then Moshe enters the tabernacle. Right? I modified some of these notes in that in that. Uh, Unprinted copy, um, which I'll happily send you. Um, okay, Parshas Baalos, we talk about the menorah, just an interesting idea on the menorah. The, the menorah, uh, or the candelabra, um, had six hands that came out of the center, the center uh, uh, post. Right? Now, the center post was taller, like we mentioned earlier, that they were all connected. And the, 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 at, at the center, but all the fires, even though they were they were away from the center, they all faced towards the center. They all faced towards the center. 
There's a special mitzvah, you should see the menorah. You should see the light of the menorah. What's the mitzvah to see the menorah? By the way, many of the Hasidic masters and Hasidic soul masters would sit and look at the menorah on Hanukkah, which is a symbolism of the, of the menorah that was in the temple, and they'd sit and look at the menorah for hours. And it's a purification of the eyes. So the, what the great sages say an incredible idea. That is, we have two sets of eyes. We have physical eyes, but we also have spiritual eyes. Our physical eyes are very, very powerful. Our spiritual eyes are even more powerful. But because they're spiritual eyes, we don't even realize that they're there. And many times, and that's one of the reasons why, we say in the Shema. We shouldn't follow our hearts, and we shouldn't follow our eyes. What type of eyes? Our physical eyes, but our spiritual eyes. That sees spiritually, it's our relationship with God. It's able to elevate us on a higher plane, on a higher level. So that's one of the reasons that we cover our eyes when we say the Shema. We're supposed to take our right hand and cover our eyes. A hand of mercy, a hand of chesed, of kindness. And we cover our eyes, our physical eyes, so that we allow our spiritual eyes to see God. Because we have so much distraction, so much materialism all around us, that that doesn't allow us to see on a higher level, to see on a spiritual level. That's the menorah. That's what, what these great soul <coughs> masters were teaching us, is to look at the menorah, because that's using our spiritual eyes to connect to a higher level, to a higher place. Okay, we have the consecration of the Levites, the offerings, the trumpets, uh, the order of breakdown of the camp. Uh, Jethro is invited to join the, join the Jewish people. The journey begins, the ark travels. When we say the ark travels, what happened was is that those who were carrying the ark, those who were fortunate to carry the ark, didn't carry the ark. The ark carried them. They thought they were carrying the ark, but really the ark carried, carried them. And when the ark rose up, traveled, and where it stopped, that's where the Jewish people camped around the ark. And it's, a big, it's, a big, it's a big thing whether or not the Torah is here to service us, or whether we're here to service the Torah. That's one of the important lessons, that wherever the ark rested is where the Jewish people rested. Many times what people like to do is, well, I'm not in the mood of this and this observance. So therefore, I'm going to find the way that the Torah is going to have to tailor itself around my lifestyle. Or, I'm going to tailor my lifestyle around what the Torah wants. And that's the real choice that we have every day, is whether or not we're going to be uh, subjecting ourselves to the Torah, or we're going to subject the Torah to our lifestyles and twist it and turn it and curve it and, and and, and make all these different uh, cholent out of the out of the Torah. We have to be very very careful about that. Okay. The complainers dissatisfaction with the mana. Suddenly they want their steaks, right? They wanted uh, they wanted uh, fish and they wanted uh, birds, slav the dagim, right? They wanted all these different different types of foods, right? Moshe is in the spirit. He says, Hashem, I can't handle this. Um, <clears throat> the Sanhedrin are set up, the, the Jewish courts, um, the new prophets are, 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 uh, are, are set up, and, the, um, and Moses is declared as humble, which is also a questionable thing. How does that happen? How does that happen that Moses, who's writing the Torah, is writing about himself that he's the most humble of all people? Right? If you look, chapter 12, I, in, in the new notes, I wrote exactly the chapter and verse uh, of that because it's so, it's so incredible. You Sounds read the like actual, Trump. what's that? Sounds like Trump. Hey, hey, no politics here. No politics here. So it says... Um, okay, chapter, 
chapter 12, verse number 3. anav me'od. Now the man Moses was humble exceedingly. Mikol adam asher adama. More than any person who is on the face of the earth. If I may say so myself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he wrote that. Right? Obviously this is God telling him. Moses was so humble that it was unthinkable to accuse him of considering himself superior to other prophets. Because of his humil humility, Moses would never have defended himself against the charge. Therefore, God had to intervene. According to one view of Sifri, Moses and, Aaron, and uh, Miriam and Aaron had confronted Moses with their criticism, but in his humility, he did not respond. And the, the commentaries continue further here. So what does it mean to be humble? What does it mean to be humble? Humble mean that I, I disregard myself? Does humble mean that I'm, I'm, I'm small, I push myself down? No, no, don't give me. I don't want to sit over there in the front of the synagogue where the rabbi sits. I'm, I'm, I'm a simple person. I'm going to sit in the back. That's not humility. It's not humility. Humility is knowing the qualities that you have and always remembering that these qualities are a gift from God. There's nothing wrong with a person using their skills and using, not, there's nothing wrong, they're obligated to. We see that there were people who were punished for not using their talents. God gives you a talent, you're required to use it. But to also remember that it's a gift from God. Someone who's a great orator has a power of speech, has to constantly remember, it's not that I'm so, oh, I'm really, uh, I'm an influential person. I know how to speak. God gave me a gift. Is what a person needs to recognize. An athlete needs to recognize. It's not that I'm great, but God gave me a talent. And I'm using that gift that God gave me. It's not that I'm great. It's almost comical when you watch these interviews of sports athletes and they talk about, yeah, so great. We practice. It's great, but it's not you. Remember that you have a gift. Right? It still sounds like boasting, though, Mark. What do you mean to himself? Well, here's the thing if someone truly believes that it's a gift, he doesn't talk about it. That's the difference. But he's talking about it. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. note that says Moses argued with God about it because he felt bad. Same. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Miriam is punished because she spoke Lashon Hara and she's quarantined. The Jewish people had to wait for her because she was a prophet. She was a very powerful person, Miriam. And the whole people, the entire Jewish people waited 30 days for her. So she was done with her quarantine, and then she was able to, uh, to join the people again. They continue. The fourth portion is the re they reject the land, right? The 12 spies are, are selected and sent. Moses prays for Joshua. The negative report of the land. They reject the land. There's a national hysteria. What are they going to do now? Like, well, this was the plan. The plan was to go to the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And now what happens? Now we got this negative report. We're done. We're toast. Where are we going to go? Um, Moses pleads, God forgives, but punishes the Jews to 40 years in wandering. And the Jews learn what the atonement offering is for the sins. And they also learn the mitzvah of tzitzit and other mitzvot. Tzitzit. Any four-cornered garment should have uh, have fringes attached to it. It's a commandment that we have. Now, if someone doesn't have a four-cornered garment, they're not obligated to that mitzvah. But today, and, and almost forever, people, specific, because we love the mitzvahs and because we want to observe them and because we want to be surrounded by mitzvahs at all time, we wear a special garment which has four corners. And that special garment uh, enables us to constantly be doing that mitzvah. There are many people who sleep with that garment. It's a problem whether or not they can do that because when they wake up, 
they can't make a blessing on the tzitzit because they've been wearing it the whole time. The blessing the is when you put them on. So, there's, so if you wear a talit, it's not a problem. And if you don't wear a talit, so what many say you do is you, you move them around and now it's like wearing it anew. Like you refresh your, uh, your, your, your wearing of them. But either way, the idea is that the Arizal says an important thing. He says that wearing tzitzit is like wearing body armor. It's your, it's your, it's your shield protecting you from... Um, from, from potential sin and keeping us holy. Korach, the portion of Korach, which is the fifth portion in Bamidbar, is the rebellion. We see the, that Korach rebels against the leadership and the priesthood. He says, Moses, who are you? He was the first cousin to Moses. He was older than Moses. And he says, well, it's, it was supposed to come from the lineage of Levi, the leader of the Jewish people. That's me. It's not you. I'm older. And um, God punishes him. How does God punish him? Anybody remember how that happened? Opens the earth up, swallows him up, and cook, along with his, uh, yeah, 250 people, right? No, 250. No, no, 250. That's later, that's later. Well, okay, that's, that's with Pinchas. That they killed those who were who were uh, inter inter uh, yeah. acting with the Midianite women. Okay, that was twenty four thousand. We'll see that. Um, okay, so God punishes them, and the gifts to the co to the Kohen, and the tithes to the Levites. Right, the tithing that the Levites get is also spoken about in Parshas Korach. Six, seven, eight, nine, and ten portions of Bamidbar are dealing with the wars. The wars that the Jewish people waged on the other nations or were attacked by other nations. Chukas deals with transition. Um, we'll see in a second what that means. Uh, the seventh is the wicked Bilam and Balak, and the third, fourth, uh, the, the eighth, ninth, and tenth are talking about the inheritance of the land. Okay, so let's see transition. The first generation, the second generation will enter the land. We see that the first generation are told they're not going to enter the land. Um, it's only going to be the next generation that's going to enter. Right? We have the laws of the red heifer. Now, the word chok. Anybody, what is the word chok? Chok is an ordinance. An ordinance is not like a law. A law makes sense. A law has reasons. A chok, an ordinance, has no reason. Right? God says... The laws of the red heifer, this is what you need to do, and that's it. And there's no, there's no explanation given. There is a reason. We don't know that reason. Moses pleaded to God that he find out, that he, God tell him that reason. And God said, I'm sorry. There's some things you won't know. Right? I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, Moses did know, but King Solomon did not know. Right? Moses Kings knew. Knew the reason for the red heifer. Oh, but, but, but King Solomon did not. Uh, Miriam dies, uh, and the water that the Jewish people were receiving in the desert was in the merit of, of, of Miriam. Now that she died, they had no merit, so they had to get a new avenue through which they're going to get the, the water. The people protest Moshe, Moses hits the rock. Why, again, why did he need to, to talk to the rock, and he ended up hitting the rock? Why? Because he was upset. Well, not only that, because they, now they needed water. Miriam yeah, passed away. But there's another thing here which is left out is that Aaron also passed away in this week's Parsha. Mm -hmm. Right? In par Parsha of Kukas. Mm -hmm. Moshe is punished not to enter the land of Israel. Now, I heard a pshat, I heard an idea that Moses intentionally hit the rock, knowing that what he would do, what he was doing was going to be punished. But he knew something else as well. Again, it's an idea. I don't, I don't remember the source for it, but I remember this a few weeks ago I heard this. And that is, Moses understood that the way in which he was going to leave this world was going to be the same, uh, the same yearning that the Jewish people will carry till the end of time. He could have entered into the land of Israel. And then the, the, the yearning would be what? The yearning, the Jewish people would have to be expelled from the land of Israel. 
But the yearning would be something else. It means throughout the history of the Jewish people will be expelled, but the yearning would be for something else. Perhaps for the Mashiach, for the, for the temple, whatever, for whatever it would be. But Moses wanted that the yearning of the Jewish people should always be to go back to land of Israel. So this was sort of a goodbye present to the Jewish people. But Moses says, I'm going to be selfless here. It's not going to be for me to go into the land. But like this, the rest of the Jewish people forever will always have a yearning to enter, to go back to the land of Israel. And you see, it's unbelievable. People of every single generation always had this yearning to go, just go back to Israel. I just want to go back to my homeland. Where does that yearning come from? That yearning comes from Moses. Right? It's an interesting idea. Again, I don't remember the source for it. I hope it's true. Um, either way, Amalek attacks the Jewish people, and uh, there's a new challenge uh, that they will die in the desert. And there are several different battles. Bilaam is a prophet. Bilaam, in fact, it says that Bilaam was such a powerful prophet. He was such a powerful prophet that um, he, he was even more powerful than Moses in his prophecy. What did that mean? So think of it like this. How would the nations of the world react when they, when, they, when they say, look, if we had someone like Moses, we would also do the right thing. But we had rotten uh, prophets, so what do you want from us? If we'd give us a good, solid prophet, we wouldn't have any issues. So God says, no problem. I'll give you even a more powerful prophet than Moses. Who is that? That was Bilaam. That's true. He used. That's a thing. Evil is a choice. It's a choice that you make. Every person is given talents and skills and abilities and, and strengths and weaknesses. The question is how we're going to use them. Not what we get. It's what we're going to do with them. Right? So you can have people who have a tremendous uh, uh, talent or a skill or, or a gift, a, a charisma, a power of influence. And there are those who use it to, to, to bridge people together, to bring nations together. to bring, And there are those who do it to, to murder millions. They have the same power of character. The question is what they're going to use it for. Rabbi, yeah. what's your definition of a prophet? A prophet is someone who has an, a, an, a, a tremendous experience and a clear uh, revelation from God. Did God really want somebody that's evil? Well, again, it's equal opportunity. You can't give the Jewish people a prophet and not give the nations of the world a prophet. So, yeah, they can have the equal opportunity. The question is what they're going to do with it. It has to be. In fact, right when we say that all of the nations received the opportunity to receive the, to, to accept the Torah, how did they? How is that going to happen? They all had prophets. They all got the same memo, right? It's an important memo. Oh, click like click to open this memo. And you click in, and it says God is God is offering you or I Hashem, your God is offering your people the Torah. And they re did reply all. What does it say in it? Right? And God sends back an individual message to each nation, to each prophet. This is what it says. That's what it says. And they said, Ah, no, thank you. We'll uh, you know, we'll take second dibs. And the Jewish people jumped on it and took it. Right? Once we accept it, God said, oh, this is my chosen people. I choose you. We have to understand what that means, that we're the chosen people, even though we were the one who chose it. Right? We can talk about that maybe on the night of Shavuot. Just as, as a quick, uh, a quick um, infomercial here, we'll talk for one second. Shavuot is next Saturday night. We're going to have classes all night at Congregation Beth Rambam, together with Congregation Beth Rambam, but all the Torch rabbis and two of the Torch Rebetzins will be there to teach classes. Uh, I believe uh, Devor Rebetzin Devorah Cohen is going to be teaching class from 12 to 1. And uh, Zahava, my wife, is going to be teaching from 1 to 2. And uh, all alongside 
those classes, there are going to be other classes taught by the male rabbis um, uh, as well. So Rabbi Johnny, Rabbi Yaakov Cohen, Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, myself, um, and others will be teaching classes. So there will be a lot of different areas where people can, uh, can, can learn whatever topic you want to learn. Uh, my topic is going to be the Torah while standing on one foot. Um, that gives me anything to speak of anything I want, right? That's it's as vague as can be, um, which is exactly the way I like it. So uh, if you want to learn the entire Torah while standing on one foot, you're welcome to join us. Um, and uh, I want to again remind you all that here at the Torch Center, there's always coffee, there's always high blazing fast Wi-Fi. You can log on with your phones or with your tablets and your and your computers. Uh, and you can come here anytime. I'm not going to give you the code to the front door while we're live broadcast. But but, um, but after class, I'll tell you all the, the code to the front door. And you're welcome to come anytime. Come, if, even if it's midnight and you can't fall asleep, you just want to learn, there's a place you can come. Come, sit down, have coffee. Uh, there's always uh, other things like... Uh, Granola bars and pastries and things like that. There you go. Enjoy, um, and uh, and it's all at your service. Um, so, so we're going to get the rest of the furniture. It's going to be even more exciting. We're going to have comfortable chairs here in the, in the classroom. You won't want to get up. Uh, and we're going to have the tables in the in the in the uh, in the uh, in the lounge. And it's fantastic. Look, Mondays. Sunday, Sunday morning we have a class. Sunday evening we have a class here in the Torch Center. Monday night we have two classes simultaneous. We have a Monday morning class for women. We have Tuesday evening we have two classes here. And now we're working on a new Wednesday evening class. Uh, Thursday night we're starting another program here. Uh, Friday afternoon we have a, a Talmud Lunch Learn. And we're starting to do a monthly, ready for this? A monthly Saturday night Havdalah. Right, which is going to be here, with a with it with live music, with uh, it's going to be broadcast live online. It's going to be fantastic. Right, this place is going to be rock and rolling. It is already. It's going to be even better. Right. So with that, we continue. We're at the eighth, uh, seventh portion in the book of Numbers. Balak. Bilaam is a, a prophet, a very powerful par prophet. God gives an ambiguous permission. Yeah, yeah, you can go, no problem. He wants to go and curse the Jewish people. Yeah, yeah, right? Now, here's the thing. It's not that God gave permission, but that's what he wants to hear. We, many times, are looking for something. We come with a premeditated answer to the question we're going to ask. Uh, many people like to ask the rabbi a question. And if the rabbi gives them the answer they don't like, they go rabbi shopping. Uh -huh. To get the answer, the, find the rabbi that's going to tell me the answer I want to hear. Um, and that, that's, again, it's going back to what we mentioned earlier, that there are two ways that a person can live their life. They can live their life saying, God is infinitely wiser and, and, and greater than any human being because we're created by God. We are formed by God. By God. God is the creator of heaven and earth. He gave us the Torah. He says, listen, you want to maximize pleasure in life? Follow the Torah. Or we say, no. I want the Torah to service me. I know what good is. And I'm going to figure out how I'm going to take apart the Torah and make it custom tailored to my wishes. To my needs. Instead of subordinating ourselves to the will of Hashem, taking the Torah and subordinating it to us. Two very different ways to live life. But one is a Torah way to live life, which is where we seek out God and we try to follow what He wants us to be doing. And again, it doesn't mean that a person is at, at the stage where they're completely, fully uh, uh, there yet. But at least that's the direction they want to they go in. Versus, they say there's a big difference between someone saying, you know something, I want to fully keep Shabbos. I'm not there yet, but I want to. I'm committed in my mind to observe the full Shabbos, and, and I'm going to be taking small steps to get there. Or they say, you know what? 
this whole Shabbos thing is really taken out of proportion, and the rabbis made certain, certain restrictions that are this, and I decide that this is the new way I'm going to observe the Shabbos. And they changed all the rules and so that it can fit my comfort. And for every person needs to think for themselves what the right thing for them is. What does God really, really want for me? Right? Okay, so God blocks his path. God tells him, don't go there. And the donkey blocks him. It's a very important thing. If you look at what Rashi says, Rashi says that he was an angel of mercy standing in front of that donkey. What do you mean angel of mercy? We sometimes have a brick wall that we hit. We lose that job. How can it be that I lost that job? Why did God do this to me? It's an angel of mercy. You don't know. He's going to get you a better job. If this job could be hell on earth. God is saving you from a terrible tragedy, from a terrible, you know, whatever it could, whatever it could be. God is preparing you for your next step in life. We think, we're only thinking what's in front of us, per peripheral vision. We're not seeing a, 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 even with our peripheral vision, how much do we see? What percentage of our, of our vision? And right over here, I already don't see both my hands, right? Over here, I can see them both still, right? But that's it I see. What's that? That's 70%, uh, 100%, 100 degrees, right? About? What's with the other 280, 260 degrees? I don't see that. You know who does see that? The Almighty does. He sees 360 degrees around us, above us, below us, everything, the whole picture. We only see what our eyes show us. It's a malach shorachim, and it's, a, it's, an, it's an angel of mercy that's blocking us, not allowing us to do the stupid thing, not allowing us to do the bad thing. Sometimes we hit that brick wall, God is saying, wake up. This is for your sake that I'm protecting you. Okay, we're going to, we got... Oh my goodness. We, okay. Enough to just read it and write. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, there's the first blessing. Balak is angered. How, why did you bless the Jews? He gives a second blessing. Balak is angered again. He gives a third blessing. Balaam's last prophecy. Uh, Bilaam, uh, Bilaam's plot to infiltrate the Jews with Midianite women. He says, if I can't kill them, I'll infiltrate them. How will I infiltrate them? We'll find for this nice Jewish boy a nice Korean woman, right? <laughs> And it's exotic because she's from the Far East, and that's perfect. And that's the way we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it done, right? And that's the way we'll be able to take take away the Jews. Pinchas doesn't like that. Pinchas is a man of God, and he takes his his spear, and he he um, he puts a spear right through with the two of them while they're cohabitating in front of the Jewish people. It says that he goes into the inner tent. Right? It says he goes into the inner tent, into the inner sanctuary of where they were. It doesn't mean that they were in the inner sanctuary, hiding someplace, doing what they were doing. It means that the inner tent of her being, of her, of her womb, is where, and that's where he put the spear. Right? Meaning he went through. He put the spear straight through the two of them. Commentaries talk about this. But he Good didn't boy. do it. What's that? Yeah, it's not a it's not a pleasant way to go. Um, they were staked out, um, but they got the point. Yeah. They got the point. Yeah, um, very grand. But um, the the uh, it's awful. I have to say it, but that was me. But Pinchas was a man. He wasn't just a zealot. There are many zealots out in the world. Many people who are going to burn American flags and burn Israeli flags and burn this flag because this candidate doesn't say what I want. That, that candidate doesn't say what I want. Or I stand against Israel. I stand for Israel. We burn this and we burn that. That's all personal things. That's our personal perspective. And we love to stand up for our convictions. But here's Pinchas is doing something which is not his own conviction. This is against God. And that I can't tolerate. He says, I'm not doing it because it bothers me. Because it's not my style. I'm a, I'm a modern Jew, or I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a Hasidic Jew, and it doesn't fit my style, and that I don't like. That's not, that's nonsense. Here he says, this is against God. No personal benefit from it. There's no personal honor for it. All it is is standing up for the truth. And he couldn't see that God's name would be, you know, blasphemed in such a way. 
couldn't couldn't handle it. So he went and did it. And you know what? Did he get punished for it? No. He got rewarded for it. What was the reward that he got? If we remember earlier, we said that the coins were already given their, their posts. He was added to the Kohanite status, which was a tremendous thing. The only one that ever happened to him. Right? Moses commanded to kill the Midianites. Uh, there's a new census. The total count now is 601,370, 730. <coughs> the daughters of oh, and there's another thing, is that 24,000 people were killed in that, in, that, uh, in that cleansing from the Midianites. We lost people. We lost people, yeah. Well, we didn't lose that many in the pre from the previous number, but I guess it grew and then it dropped back again. Okay. 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 The daughters of Tzlaot, 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 the
God says enough. Enough, which also tells us, by the way, if you get the answer no, you know, you can learn a lot about fundraising from children. Right? Because children, they ask you for a lollipop. They ask you for a lollipop and you say no. And what happens? They say, oh, okay. No. Right? They come back and ask, can I have the lollipop? Right? And you say no. And they ask again, can I have the lollipop? Until you say yes. That's the way we need to beseech God for anything that we want. Right? You want something, don't let up. Keep on asking and asking and asking. We see our patriarchs and our matriarchs, they didn't stop asking Moses begs God again and again and again until God says, enough. You're not going in. Okay, never forget what you've seen. God talks about the exiles. Ten commandments are repeated. The Shema part one. We have a review of Exodus 5 and 6. The reminder not to be too comfortable because when you're too comfortable, what happens? We kick up against God. Right? We, put our, we sit back on the, on the recliner. We become complacent. And we just, uh, and we just, uh, yep, yeah, and, we, and we, get, we get caught up in life. Uh, put our trust in God. Teach your children. It's such an important mitzvah in the Torah is to teach our children. And by the way, there's no time in life where that's too late. We can always teach our children. We have to find a way, even if they're married, even if they're, even if they're grandparents, there's still, you can still impact your children. It doesn't have to be, well, you know, you should do this and that. There's a right way to do it. We have to do it with wisdom. We have to do it with a lot of thought. But there's a right way to even older children to educate them. But that's our mitzvah to constantly teach our children. And you're a holy nation. Remember that you're a holy nation. And that we need to be distinct in our actions. We have to be distinct in the way we dress. We have to be distinct in, 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 in the way we conduct ourselves. Okay. Akev is about the concepts. Reward for good deeds, reassurance and security for, 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 for our survival. The lessons of food, the mana, the miracles in the desert. It's not the food that sustains us, it's God that sustains us. Uh, the warning against the lure of prosperity. Uh, remember Egypt, the temporary ark, the second tablets, Aaron's death, the greatness and promotion of the Levites. All God wants from us. What does God want from us? Right? To do good to us. Because he loves us. He wants to give us good. That's what he wants. He wants to give us good. How do we do that? By earning it. It's no good to get freebies. Nobody feels good getting freebies. Even Jews who like to go to conventions and get all those freebies. You see, we, what do you like? we still hide it. Okay? Nobody likes to get the freebies. Okay? I like it. You like it, but still we're a little bit ashamed. There's the bread of shame, right? There's a whole concept of bread of shame that we, we uh, but we still, um, we want to earn it. It's much more, it's much more uh, pleasant, right, to earn a, 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 a living than to wait online and get the food stamps. Well, right? God wants from us, for us to say 10, 10, 12, what does that mean? That's chapter 10, verse 12. You can go see it in uh, Deuteronomy. First-hand witness of miracles and greatness of the land. God is reminding us, you saw with your own eyes the miracles that I performed to the Egyptians. It's not, oh, your grandparents. You saw it. You saw it with your own eyes. And Shema part 2 <coughs> is at the end of Parshish Acre. For A is the influences. Choice of blessing or curse. It's our choice whether we're going to live with blessing in our life or whether we're going to live with a curse in our life. The sanctity of the land. Remember that it's holy. Offering only on God's chosen altar. Now we're not allowed to make other altars. Um, holiness of the offerings and the eat and laws of eating. Principles of, 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 of observance. Don't copy the gentle, Gentiles. Missionaries, enticers, false prophets, and idolatry are all spoken about in Parshas A. The Jews are a treasured people, and the review of the laws of kosher, tithes, loans, and kindness. And, of course, the pilgrimages to the land of Israel, which are three times a year, Shalosh Pamim Bashana, Yere'ekos Chochai, you're supposed to see the land of Israel, which is Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And, it, you know, Pesach and Sukkot is a mass, mass, mass uh, blessing of the, of the Kohanim, uh, the Kohanites, at the Wailing Wall, at the Western Wall. 
And now hundreds of thousands of Jews come to hear the blessings of the coin. Right? Of many coins. Like rows and rows and rows of coins. It's amazing. Shavuot, there's no intermediate, intermediary days. So people can't drive to the Western Wall. At least right, in the observance of, of, of the Shavuot. So middle of the night, when everyone's learning the whole night, masses and masses of people walk to the Kotel from all over Jerusalem. It's unbelievable. It's an incredible, incredible sight. Jews from all over coming and they pray at the Alot HaShachar by the, by the awakening of the sunrise, right? And, and, uh, and they pray with song and dance at the Western Wall. If you have the opportunity to go ever to Israel, I highly recommend. It's a special time to be there. Okay? Shoftim is talking about the administration of the Jewish people, the justice system, the courts and the police established. The blemished sacrifices are forbidden. Right? So if you, even if you slaughter an animal properly, if later on there, it's found to have a blemish, it renders it retroactively <coughs> non-kosher. And it goes to Purdue. And it goes to Purdue and Tyson. Right? Uh, the death penalty for idolatry, warning to listen to judgment of sages and courts, the laws of kings, priestly gifts, prophecy, prophets, cities of refuge, antitrust, boundaries, conspiring witnesses, war, kohanim, leadership, uh, fighters, qualifications, uh, peace, fruit trees, and unresolved murders, and acts, heifer, all of these laws are discussed at the end of Parsha's Shoftim. Then we talk about the social code, which is women of beautiful form during war. Uh, if, if we can spend some time dealing with this one story, it's an amazing, amazing lesson in the value of how a, we in Torah values women and what it, what the whole image that the world has of men and women and the role of women versus the role of men is so messed up and how the Torah shows us that a man needs to elevate himself to be worthy and perfect for the woman that he seeks to marry so it's like they you know there was a whole article I heard this from a friend of mine, Rabbi Yitzhak Feldheim. He says that there's a whole article that um, uh, they were talking about how sexist this whole um, Disney, all these Disney movies, where the woman is always in trouble and the man comes on the white horse, the prince comes, and he comes and, and sweeps her off her feet, and uh, they live happily ever after. But she's always in trouble and she's always, uh, you know, needing, uh, needing a redeemer. So he says it's exactly true. But think about what happens to the boy, to the, man, to the prince, prior to, to picking her up on the white horse. He thinks to himself, how am I going to be worthy to, 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 uh, to deserve this princess? What am I going to do to deserve it? I've got to get a job. I've got to be a mensch. I've got to clean myself up. I gotta dress like a mensch. I gotta wake up on time. I gotta be. I, I, I gotta act in according in the proper way, and only then will I be worthy. And that's when he comes on that white horse. After he did all of that work to prepare himself, now he comes on that white horse and he can he can get it. But that they don't show you in the movie, right? But you think about it, right? If you think about it, people <coughs> who, who have had a, a, a oh, I wish I can get that girl. What am I going to do to deserve her? Why should she say yes to me? That means we take it, we say no. You can't just take this woman from the, field, from the war, from the battlefield, and live with her. No, no, no. You have to dress her up. You have to, you have, you have to, oh, after 30 days, you still, after all this, right, now you still think of her as being someone that you, you aspire to be with. Now you can marry her after, after that amount, of, after, after that time. It's not such a simple thing. You just, oh, Use women. No, it's not. It's a very different world. The Torah way of life is not, is not the same thing at all. Okay, we speak about the firstborn rights where a firstborn uh, has a double portion in inheritance, the wayward son, the hanging and burial um, uh, for certain, for certain uh, sins. There are certain punishments, four different types of punishments. The concern for other people, others' property, a lost object in Aveda, the male and female garb, Right? Men shouldn't dress like women, and women shouldn't dress like men. Right? Um, specific mitzvah in the Torah. Right? 
i.e. current events, let's not get into it. Um, the laws of Shiloh HaKen, which is um, uh, if you find a bird uh, with its young, okay, this, all of those laws, the fence on a roof, you should build a fence on a roof, you shouldn't fall off. Uh, tzitzit, the laws of Tzitzit, Motzi Shemra, uh, spreading a bad word about other people, um, falsely, adultery, restricted marriages, forbidden to marry non-Jews. We spoke about this in Deuteronomy 7.3. Over here's a review for it. And the forbidden uh, for Moabite and Ammonite males to marry into the Jewish people. See Deuteronomy 23.4. Sanctity of people, slight and sexuality, interest, charging interest on loan money, uh, vows, workers' rights, divorce and remarriage, kidnapping, sarat, which is the uh, the uh, saras is the, uh, the, 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 the the leprosy, the leprosy, slander, debtors, timely payment to workers. I mean, these are incredible things that the Torah is telling us. Orphans, how to treat orphans and widows, and how to treat the converts. The gift to the poor, the lashes, yibum, leverite marriage, lever, leverate marriage, and chalitza, not to embarrass others. Honest weights and measures. Uh, remember Amalek. You know that. Just an interesting thing. If you go to one of the one of the supermarkets and they weigh your 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 apples, right? That machine needs to be tested every so often by the <coughs> weights and means. I don't know what it's called. Whatever they have, that weights certain, and weight, not weights and means. Weights, 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 weights and measures. Weights, weights and measures. measures. Sorry, weights and measures uh, department of the of the government. Why? Because if if you put a half a pound of apples and it measures like an like a pound. Because someone had their hand when they were calibrating it, they're cheating their, the, the populace. It's, you got to be very, very careful about that. Um, I do know, I do know a Jewish business that had their thing off, and they put out a big, a big notice to the entire community that uh, they, were, they found that there was a mistake, and they by mistake overcharged people on the on whatever the product that they were selling, and they they asked for whoever it was to come back in, and they're going to give them whatever the product was. They'll give them more of that product. So let's say if it's if it's ice cream or if it's something like that, they're going to give them more so that they, they don't want to owe people money. And if they ask, if they don't come, please forgive us so that we don't have to, you know, um, it's very, very, it's it's a terrible thing for people to steal. Not to embarrass others, honest weights and measures, and remember Amalek. Next, the blessing and curses, the first fruits of, of the land, the tithes, the inseparable relationship between God and Israel, the new commandment, new commitment to Torah, Blessing and curses for observance of the mitzvot, Har Grizim and Har Abel, which is the two mountains where we 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 we're basically shown we can we can have two choices constantly between the good and the bad. Moses' final charge till the end of the Torah. We had freedom of choice, renewal of the covenant, warning for idolatry, eventual redemption and repentance. You can access Torah. There's no such thing. I can't do it. You can access Torah. Choose life. It's your Choice, good or bad, life or death. The leadership transfer, Moshe leaves, and the new leader, Joshua, is selected. Hakel, which is the Jewish people, gather together, and the Torah itself is the testimony of our relationship with God. There's the song, the song of Moses, uh, which is the whole Hazinu's one big song, God's kindness to Israel. The prosperity uh, bring uh, disillusion. Prosperity, again, it's reminding us that when we have too much, we lose our 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 uh, our direction. God's wrath that He will punish us if we go against Him. We have sources for Israel's suffering and Israel's comforted. Um, and the last commandment to Moses is given. Moses, the man of God, blesses each tribe, gives gives each a copy of the Torah. Moshe sees the land again, and then there's the death of Moses. Moshe is eulogized in a very extraordinary way. I was eulogized. Anybody remember? Eved Hashem. Two words. Servant of God. We'll see what that means in one second. The burial place of Moses is unknown. See if he does become a... A... Um, a what? what? An idol. Right? And uh, Moses' greatness. There was no prophet like him ever. There will be no prophet like him. And the Jews mourn 30 days for Moses. Now, what does it mean? Servant of God. So there's a known principle in, in halacha that a servant, whatever a servant acquires, belongs to his master. So if you have a servant, a slave, and the slave, the slave 
goes in the street and finds a diamond bracelet, 